Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is the first video that I'm going to start making about network classes, and I'm going to start posting those videos, of course, to the Blackboard. Now, um, today I'm going to talk about the module 11 IPv4 addressing, which we covered part of it uh, before the spring break. Um, uh, I sent around like two emails, I think, about the exams and about how we're going to run this course from now till the end of the semester. So I want everybody to go and check those emails. That'll be number one. Number two, um, I'm working on a Word document that will summarize this chapter. And let me just tell you, this is the most difficult chapter, and this is where you're going to have to work a little bit harder. So this Word document here that I just created will summarize everything about this chapter, and I hope it's going to be useful for for you. I am going to post it once I am done with it. So um, let's get back here to the PowerPoint. Um, as I said before, we started uh, working on this chapter before the spring break, and it's all about IPv4. And <clears throat> the types of IPv4, we said we have unicast, multicast, and broadcast IP addresses. Um, we talked about how do we calculate the network IP address, giving the host IP address, and we talked about the subnet mask and how do we present the subnet mask. Um, we also talked about what is a prefix. Um, we said you, we're going to use a logical AND operator to find out the network IP address. And uh, that's pretty much it. That's what we covered the last time. Now, we're going to start from this point. This is the part that we didn't have a chance to talk about. Now, before I start talking about this part, I'm just going to go through the board document that I just created. And here it is. I'm just giving you some facts about IPv4 length, uh, how is it going to be organized, and uh, we have the subnet mask and the prefix. Why do we need them? And how do we convert between the prefix and the subnet mask? All, all of this is explained with examples. So I hope this is going to be very helpful. And then I um, ask you here, for example, if the subnet mask was this number, what is the prefix? So I ask you to, uh, I answer that question, and I found out that the prefix is 26. And here I think I gave you the prefix, and I am asking you about the subnet mask. This is something everybody needs to know. And also, before I forget, you need to go to the Net Academy and watch all the videos there. They are very, very important, and you need to watch them. And remember, if you have any question at any time, just send me an email with it. Why do we need subnet mask? I answered that question here, and then I followed that with how I'm going to use the subnet mask. So I provided you a point, and then after that, I took it. And I use those points with example here. Um, I use some colorations here so you will understand what's going on. And after that, I gave you an example and I ask you to do it yourself. Do it yourself. Now after that, uh, I moved to another topic where you will be giving the host IP address and you will be asked to find out the network IP address, the broadcast IP address the first available host IP address, the last available host IP address, and how many IP addresses are available. Now, those calculations with explanations, I hope they're going to be helpful. You can use them in your exams. Um, it will be a good idea to understand them so you can get the job done faster when you do an exam, because if you're not going to be able to do it fast, you may run out of time. And then after that, I give you another exam, and I ask you to repeat whatever happened here, only using a different IP address. And now I, uh, why is he complaining about this? Subnetting, oh, there's a double T, of course. Um, I'm going to get to this part later today. So let's just go back to the PowerPoint. Types of IP addresses. Now, we already talked about types of IP addresses before, but let's just go back to that. And let's look at this IPv4, unicast, broadcast, and multicast. Basically, those are the type of addresses depending on 
the destination that you try to get connected to. So if you're trying to get connected one computer to the other, we said it's going to be called a unicast. If you're trying to get connected to a group of computers, call it multicast. If you're trying to get connected to all the computers in your network, call it broadcast. And it's important to understand those special IP addresses. Now let's go back, let's go here to the types of IP addresses as well. <clears throat> Generally, we can categorize IP addresses into public and private. And there's also more categories, but those are the main two categories. And we talked about that before. And I said, uh, we have a limitation of the IP before. So the concept of private IP address, public address, so we can actually use the available IP addresses to get all the devices around the world connected. So. We said private IP addresses could be duplicated as long as those two computers are not trying to get connected together. But the moment your computer is trying to go and connect to a remote device globally, your private IP address will not work anymore. Yet you have to convert it to a public. And again, I remember I covered that multiple times in, during the semester. So we do have a tool that will convert your private pub, uh, IP address to a public by a private. Uh, public IP address um, and usually whenever you go to a company and you want to subscribe for internet they will lease you a public IP address and then inside your home all your devices are going to have a private IP address every time any of these devices try to get connected to the internet that private IP address will be converted to a public IP address to be able to do that and again the algorithm or the protocol, sorry, that we use to convert a private IP address to a public address is called NAT, Network Address Translation. <clears throat> now, this is something we covered before, but what we didn't cover is those numbers. And if you focus and look at this number, you will notice that since the beginning of the semester, I've been using 192, 168 all the time. Well, that's because it's a private network IP address. We do have three main uh, range of private IP addresses. We have this one here, and we have, sorry, this one here, and this one here, and this one here. And as you can see here, the main difference between them is the prefix here. I got eight bits, I got 12 bits, and I got 16 bits here. And that basically tells you how many devices each one of those networks could have. Remember, we said, to find out how many devices you can have in a network is basically, um, it's 2 to the power of the number of bits for the host minus 2. So for example, the first one here, in this network I basically can have, let me just go get the calculator. So since I have 8 bits for the prefix, that basically means I have 24 bits for, um, for the host. So it's going to be, let's go to scientific, so it's 2 to the power, where is it, not you, not you, 2 to the power, not 2, oh my god, where's the C, here it is, okay, 2 to the power, of 24 equal this number minus 2. So I got 16,777,214 different devices I can have in that network. Now, who would have a network with that much of computers? Of course not. But again, it's an option that you have. We usually use this one here, the last one, 192.168.00. That's less number of computers, and again, this is going to be a big deal later on. We're going to talk about that later. But what do you have to remember now, in, especially in the exam? You will be giving IP addresses, and you will be asked about to categorize that IP address. So that basically means you need to remember those numbers. I hate memorizing numbers especially. I can remember facts, but numbers, it's very, very easy to make mistakes with. So, as I said before, you are allowed to have that piece of paper where you put some critical information that could help you answer the question. So, go ahead and have those ready for you. This is again the prefix 
for the IP addresses, and here's the range of the IP addresses. So you'll be given an IP address, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. And then you're going to be asked about, um, what is this IP address? Is it public or is it private? Well, you can check in this range here, in this area, and you can tell if it's private or not. Now, if it's not private, what do we do? What else do we have when it's public? Well, we do have two different other categories, the loop back address and the link local address. Now, you have to remember those very, very clear. Let me start with the loop back. You guys remember when I try to ping a device with the address 127.0.0.1.8 and I told you guys this is me trying to test the configuration of my device to make sure that everything works just fine. Well, that's a loopback address. Um, the other types, and again, sometimes we just create them. They don't exist in reality, but just for testing. And again, they have to go in this range, as you can see here. 172, 127.0.0.1 all the way to 127.255.255.254. Now, think about this. What if I change this one to be 255? What type of IP address is that going to be? I'll just tell you. That's a broadcast. Anyway, let's get back here. Link local. Now, this concept here is extremely important to understand. It's not going to be that important in IPv4, but it's going to be important in IPv6. Now, you have a computer. You are trying to get connected to a network, or the internet for that matter. But let's just say network. And you didn't configure it manually. You didn't go to your computer and assign an IP address to it by yourself. And then your computer was looking around, is there any DHCP server that can help me here? Your computer is looking, there is no DHCP server. So your computer is trying to get connected to the network. At the same time, you didn't go ahead and manually set an IP address. And at the same time, there is no server to give your computer an IP address. So what your computer is going to do? Well, basically, your computer is going to use Windows. The operating system. The operating system is going to generate a, an, an IP address, and that IP address is called link local. And again, link local basically means I'm creating this IP address to be connected locally in this network. Now, um, what if another computer was having the same issue? and there's no DSCP, you didn't give it in the IP address manually, well, it's going to generate its own link local IP address. Now, the problem is, what if those two machines just happen to create the same IP address? We said again, you cannot have two machines within the same network to have the same IP address. Well, here's what's going to happen. Usually, whenever your computer is going to generate this link local IP address, it's just going to Tell everybody, send a broadcast message, this is my IP address. If any of you guys are using this IP address, you have to speak now. Otherwise, just shut your mouth forever. And again, so if your computer is going to send that message to everyone, and it just happened that one of the computers already is using that IP address, then that computer will tell your computer, you know what, the IP address that you just talk, told me about, is reserved. I used. I'm using it right now. So go ahead and generate a new one. And that's basically how it works. So IP addresses basically categories are public, private, loopback, and link local. And to tell the truth, that's not all of them. There's a lot of more. And in this new C uh, CCNA, they decided to take them out. We're just keeping those four. But okay, good for me. I'm fine with that. Now. Let's move on to um, another way to classify IP address. Now, just remember, this is a different story. Here we go. When, you, when you'll be given an IP address, you basically can categorize it into a class A or class B or class C or D or, or E. Each one of those class basically depends on the prefix. As you can see here, class A has a prefix of 8, class B has a prefix of 16, 24, D... Well, um, we don't use D and E a lot. Let me just tell you that. We usually just use A, B, and C. 8, 16, 24. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes, I'm just going to tell you, you'll be given an IP address, and sometimes they don't tell you what's the prefix. They just keep it 
they don't tell you it's 16 or 24 or 8. They will tell you this is a class C IP address or this is a class B or it's a class A. So you need to understand what is the meaning of class A or B or C. That basically means the prefix is 8 and that basically means the subnet mask is 255.0.0.0. If it's class B, then the subnet mask is basically 255.255.0.0. If it's class C, then it's 255.255.255.0. Again, it's just a way to play with words. Instead of giving you a number for the prefix or the subnet mask, I will just tell you what is the class, class of that IP address. <coughs> And we said that we talked about this Simon IP addresses publicly. Every single region in the world, basically, there is an organization that is responsible of assigning IP addresses. So this here, the map will just show you each part of the world. And for example, here in the United States, we have ARIN organization, which basically is responsible of deciding each company and how many public IP addresses are they going to be using. And same thing for Africa, for South America, for Europe and Russia, for Southeast Asia and Australia. Again, you don't have to remember all this, but just to give you an idea. The, again, let's go back here. The reason why we do have this here, because those organizations, basically, they communicate with each other. And each one of them knows the range of IP addresses that they have. So no one, basically, for example, in uh, America here, in North America, you will not be using IP addresses available for Russia or for uh, Europe or Middle East or whatever the region of the world is. Okay, so let's go back here. Network segmentation. Now, this is kind of a big deal, and I am so surprised that we just have three slides here to talk about it. But I'm just going to go ahead and give you information and explanation about this. Network segmentation. What is network segmentation? Well, let me just give you a story and I want you to imagine it here. Imagine you have a network and in this network you have, let's say, a thousand of computers. Now, if each one of those computers, of course, you're not going to go manually assign an IP address to each one of them. You're going to use a DHCP server. So each one of them will get an IP address automatically. Now, every time, every time one of those computers will be turned on, it's automatically going to produce what we call a broadcast message. And this broadcast message basically means it says, hey, I need an IP address. And that broadcast message is going to be sent to every single computer in that network, to, to the thousands of them. Now imagine that all the 999 computers are going to be doing the same thing at the same time, all the time. So all the time, Every single computer in that network is basically going to be sending a broadcast message that every single other computer is going to receive it. So, what's going to happen? What is the result of that? Well, basically, what's going to happen, every single device will be busy all the time just receiving those broadcast messages and, and dropping them. Because again, remember, I'm a computer, I'm not a server. And every single computer will receive 999 broadcast message asking him about, are you the server? And he's going to say no and drop it, no and drop it. You're wasting the time and the resources of your computer. That's problem number one. Number two, you have a bandwidth. You have a limitation of how many data could be carried in the network. And you're going to be wasting the network uh, bandwidth on these broadcast messages. So, what I'm trying to say here is, the bigger the network you have, and by by the bigger network, I basically means the big, the, the greater the number of computers you have in the network, the more resources are going to be wasted for each computer in that network, and you're going to be killing the bandwidth of your network using those broadcast messages. So what is the solution? Well, we have a very simple and easy solution. If you have a big network, let's say, of a thousand computers, let's just simplify it for a hundred of computers. It's very easy if I if I decided that I will divide my big network into a smaller network, and that's basically what we mean by segmentation. You have a big network, and you divide that big network into a smaller networks. 
And then you connect those smaller networks using routers. Now, why routers? What is going to happen with routers? Well, the routers have one feature which is extremely important. And that router, that feature is me means basically, whenever you broadcast, whenever your router receive a broadcast message, the router will not send it to the next network. So, let me just see if I have a picture here that explains it a little bit better. Okay, let's just look at this big network here. I got network one, two, three, four, five. So I got five networks, and they are in a big building five floors or something now if I put them all in one network let's imagine there's a hundred devices in each network so that would make the 500 devices producing all these network broadcast messages okay now if I divided this big network into a hundred for each now if a broadcast message was produced for example at level one here that broadcast message is going to move to the router the router is going to realize this is a broadcast message, so it's going to drop it, so none of those devices are going to receive it. Same thing happens, for example, at level 5. If a broadcast message was produced by one of the computers in this level here, and then that broadcast message is going to be moved all the way to the router, the router is going to drop that message, so all the other 400 devices will not receive that broadcast message, and that way you can save the resources and save the, brand, uh, the bandwidth. So you have to put that under consideration. Whenever you build a big network for big companies, big organizations, basically you cannot put all the devices within one network. You have to divide it into multiple networks. Here's reasons why we do subnetting well. Subnetting will re re reduce overall network traffic, as I said before. Um, we can have some security levels between those networks. So, for example, if I can apply a security level here, a high security than the other ones. Maybe the information in this level are more important than the information in those two other levels. So I can add a level of security here uh, rather than applying it to the whole network. Um, the number of uh, something to reduce the number of devices affected by the uh, broadcast traffic. We talked about that. And there's another reason why maybe sometimes we have different locations, so every single location will have a different subnet mask, or we have basically different groups. Big network, those are human resources, financial services, academic something something, management, or IT department. So each, all of them are within the same organization, but each one of them has a different functionality. So for each one of those departments, we give them a different network. Or sometimes we can divide the network depending on the devices. So all the network, all the let's say, all the printers are going to be in one network, all the servers are going to be in one network, and all the computers are going to be in a different network. So this is again what we mean by segmentation, dividing your big network into a smaller networks. How is that going to be done? We're going to talk about that later, but for now, we just need to understand the reason. <clears throat> the key here is basically to have a router. Very, very important. Your router will act as a broadcast uh, messages dropper. Every time your router can receive a drop, uh, a broadcast message is going to drop it instead of sending it to everyone else. And that way you can reduce the number of broadcast messages passed in the network. Now, how do we do that? Well, now here's the bad news. I really don't like the way network subnet uh, net academy is explaining the concept. Do I have to remember all these numbers? Yes, that's basically what they're telling you. And again, I don't like this. I don't like that a bit. And then you can watch those videos, which I highly recommend. Go ahead and watch those videos. It could make it easier for you. So what I'm going to do here, I am going to go and explain how do we do subnetting. Okay? You can listen to whatever I'm going to say. And at the same time, you can... Go ahead and watch those videos and see whatever works for you. Whatever makes you understand the concept better, go for it. But I'm going to go and talk about how do we do that, how do we do the calculations for the subnetting. And uh, again, this whole thing here, I'm going to skip it. You can go ahead and read it for the subnetting. Well, before we, I start talking about subnetting, um, again, I'm going to just simplify it in formula. Um, we have two types of uh, subnetting. We have what we call a fixed subnetting, and we have VLSM, 
variable. Let me just make sure that I want to. I don't want to make a mistake with. Uh, is it mentioned here? No. Look at this. They just give it to you like that, and you have to understand what it is. Okay, let's just go here. Variable length subnetting. But I'm not sure about the M here. Maybe mask, subnet mask. Yeah, variable length subnet mask. I think that's what it is. Okay, so we have two types. Just remember that. We have a fixed subnetting masks, and we have variable length subnetting masks. So I'm going to start with the fixed one. Now I'm going to jump into a Word document, and I'm going to explain that concept there. And here we go. Now, before we do anything, we have two types. Let's just put it here. Fix. Subnet. Mask. Now we have VLSM. Now I'm going to leave the VLSM to talk about it later. Now, in this area, we have two, uh, two scenarios. Let's put it that way. The first scenario, fixed number of networks. And we have another scenario, fixed number of hosts. So, what do we mean by that? Sometimes, you will be giving a network IP address, and you will be asked to divide this network IP address into a number of networks. And you will be, excuse me, you'll be giving that number of networks. Five, six, eight, seven. That's basically what we mean by a fixed number of networks. Sometimes they don't tell you how many networks they want. They will tell you, well, here's the IP address for the big network, and I want you to divide it so every single network will have five devices, or six devices, or ten devices, or twenty-two devices. So I tell you the number of hosts, and then you have to divide the network based on that. Or, I tell you the number of networks that I want, and then you tell me how many, um, how many hosts you can have in each network, or, and if I tell you this is the number of hosts that I want, then you can tell me I can create two networks or three networks, based on your requirement. So, how is that possible? Well, let's go ahead and use an example here. The idea here is very simple. Let's say we have a network IP address, 192.168.75, and let's say 0. And I'm going to choose a very easy example here, 24. That's my network IP address. Okay, now let's say I need to have mm, let's say six I networks. I need six, six networks. So how do I divide this IP address, a single network IP address, into six network IP addresses? Well. You have to remember here, of course, it's not just dividing, you have to tell me what is the IP address for those six IP addresses. Now, this is where it gets a little bit complicated, and I want you to pay attention to this. I take this network IP address that I'm going to highlight, and I need to convert it to binary. And to do so, I think I do have, let's say, 11000000. Um, another zero. And then one zero one zero one zero zero zero, and the seventy five. Let's go ahead to the calculator again. Again, remember I'm doing this just for the purpose of saving some time. Uh, decimal seventy five. Here it is. Okay, zero one zero zero one zero one one, and then I got eight zeros. That's basically my network IP address. Binary IPv4 network address. Oh, I don't like how it looks. Let me just fix this. Okay, 
So here we go. This is the, the IP address. Now, what I have to do, I need to go look at this 24. 24 basically means this portion here, let me highlight it with a color yellow, is the network portion and this is the host portion. So let's just go ahead and put a different color here. Now, the idea here is very simple. You have to ask yourself this question. How many bits, all right, you, I want you to remember this, how many bits do I have to borrow from the host portion to the network portion to be able to divide the network into a six different networks? Extremely important to understand. How many bits do I have to borrow from the host portion to the network portion so I can divide my network into six uh, portions? So this is basically the network, the host portion here. And what I have to do, I have to count how many bits that I have here from the left side to the right side. Very important to remember this, from the left side to the right side. How many bits do I have to borrow so I can actually have uh, the right, correct number of networks that I have. Now, how do I figure that out? Well, basically, we're going to use this equation. 2 to the power of the number of bits borrowed That's it. Should be, again, should be greater or equal number of networks. And let me just put it to the power. Again, it has to be to the power. So, 2 to the power of the number of bits borrowed should be greater or equal the number of networks that I'm looking for. So remember, you're going to borrow number of bits here, and that number of bits basically need to be greater or equal to the number of hosts after you apply this formula here. So let's just go ahead and do this. Let's imagine I'm going to borrow one bit, and I'm going to highlight it here, just one. Let's choose a different color. Um, I'm going to go with... Uh, If I borrow one bit, that basically means basically means two to the power of one greater or equal six. And let's see if this is correct. Well, if I just put it here, not good enough. Not enough. Again, because why? Two to the power of one is one, and uh, sorry, two to the power of, of one is two, and two is not greater or equal to six, so that's not enough. Let's borrow another bit. So let's just copy this. Nope. Put it down, and I'm going to put two bits now. 2 to the power of 2 is 4, and 4 is not greater than or equal 6, so that's not enough. Let's try to borrow 3. And let's put 3 here. Now, 2 to the power of 3 is 8, and 8 is actually greater than 6, so here we go. That's enough. <clears throat> Let me just highlight this part so you understand it. So you, you start basically borrowing one bit and you see if the formula will be true or correct. One is not enough, two is not enough, and then when I borrow three bits and I found out that that will be enough. So three bits basically will get the job done. So. What do I do after that? Well, here's what you have to do. Based on this number of bits, you can tell me now how many networks
you can create. Well, I need six, but I actually can create eight. How did I find out? It's basically two to the power of three. So the idea here is basically, I'm going to borrow three bits from the host portion to the network portion, and that will be enough to create eight bits, uh, sorry, eight networks, and I do have, I do need six only, so there will be two extra, which is okay. Now after we're done with that, this is where it gets a little bit, we have to pay attention. I need to, I want to make a list of all the networks I've had. So I'm going to say, first, network address. And since I have eight of them, let's go ahead and create them. So this is six, seven, eight. <clears throat> so let's just change this to be two and D. And I just realized that I have an appointment right now. So what I'm going to do, I am going to stop the video. And I'm going to continue later. So this is going to be the end of this part. Later on, I'm going to post the second part where I'm going to show you how to calculate each one of those network IP addresses.